Welcome to the Early Wedge presented by BetMGM. I am your host, Eric Cohen, a.k.a. EC. Make sure to like this video, and if you're not already, what are you doing? Subscribe to the Sportsline YouTube page for this content and many other great shows, including a new one coming up Friday, which I'll tell you about uh, later in the program. But let's bring in the stars of the show, because with my picks, I'm certainly not it. Uh, we have the host of the Early Edge and one of the great golf cappers in the world. That is one C and Ajad. And we have one of the great golf minds in the world who I think, if I'm correct, did you have Keith Mitchell last week, Patrick? Uh, no, I faded Keith Mitchell. Actually. Okay, that was good. I'm glad you did. I'm glad you faded him. Yeah. That was something on Sunday. And I don't know, like, we were talking about this before the show. I don't know how you bet Keith Mitchell to win anytime soon after watching that collapse. Are you with me? You know, it happens. It's It's tough to win on the PGA Tour once you get rolling the wrong way uh it can spiral especially at a course like the copperhead so uh you know i wasn't on him personally so i i don't have that vendetta against him and i know you're someone who holds grudges yes i am um so for you perhaps but for me not really all right so see uh i mean keith mitchell was plus 185 going into the last round had a two-shot lead feeling pretty good of course i went and, and added him to some sunday tickets that i had so if you're me, like, do you hold vendettas like I do after watching a guy completely melt down as Keith Mitchell did on Sunday? I wish you had contacted me because I was not thinking Keith Mitchell was going to hold on to that lead. I mean, what he did on the final three holes in the snake pit on, on Saturday, I just, you know, anytime something like that happens, I'm waiting for the fall. And in, in Keith Mitchell's case, it happens so early and often. I, I got to be honest, though, I'm still sort of. I'm kind of triggered by that tournament because I we had Cameron Young, right? I had plus 2,500, yeah. and he went into the final hole because I was looking to potentially live bet Malnati because he was like plus a pretty big number. He went into that final hole at minus 400 to win the tournament. And Peter Malnati, I believe at the time, was plus 330. And then the, the, the course of events happened where Cameron Young, of course, put it in the woods, but then the relief on 17 that Malnati got, it all of a sudden – the odds froze. They were off the board. And then all of a sudden, Malnati was like a minus 300 favorite. It was such a ridiculous turn of events. Like two things that happened at the same time that completely flipped the tournament. Uh, I was like mentally in anguish in that moment. Yeah, I. it feels like the 2022 PGA Championship in a way. I mean, not quite as dramatic. Where Mito Pereira goes to the 18th tee. What was he? I think he was what? One up, Patrick? Is that right? And then he double bogeyed and missed the playoff. Is that if my memory serves me correctly? That sounds correct. Yeah, so that's why when, when that happens, that you're added to the ban list. And that's why Cameron Young is somebody that is on my no-bet list. But let's talk about this week's storylines for the Houston Open. All right, Patrick, you've said this storyline. I think this is, what, three out of the last four weeks, two out of the last three weeks. All right, what do you got with Scotty? Yeah, Scotty Scheffler is going to win again, unfortunately, for all of us. He's around three to one. He's gotten shorter at some books. So that implies, what, a 25% chance that this guy's going to win. And look, honestly, you give this guy four tries at this tournament, I think he probably wins once, maybe even maybe even one point, whatever that is. So I don't think the odds are that, uh, that off. I think they're pretty fair to tell you the truth. And just to give mm -hmm. you some context for how good Scotty Scheffler has been, the gap between him and Sahith Thigala, who ranks third in total strokes gained this year, uh, is the same gap between Thigala and Nate Lashley. Uh, who nice. who is averaging about 0.3 strokes per round. Uh, Scotty Scheffler is at 3.23. A little more color for you. Over the last 12 months, Scotty Scheffler is number one in the world in strokes gained tee to green. Colin Morikawa is number five. Scotty Scheffler has doubled Colin Morikawa's total from tee to green over the last 12 months. So, yeah, I think it's Scotty's to lose, obviously, and I think he's going to, I think he's going to get it done again and we're, and we're just all along for the ride we're we're what five minutes into the show and you already told us what's going to happen we're not even waiting till the end of the, the show for our Spoiler outright. alert that's yeah, all but, folks but but wait c has <laughs> got that i think i think i'm on c's train here and what's your storyline well i mean listen this is this is a weird tournament i think there's a couple of different options that i wouldn't normally entertain one is to scale back the outright card listen you can make money we, we do it week to week we try to at least in in the head-to-head -head matchups department uh tournament matchups round matchups of course you know sometimes finishing positions go well they actually went well for me last week hitting two out of three including the plus 220 on andrew novak but 
Long story short, like I don't think I'm going to be investing as much in the outright market. And to the extent you do, I really think you're probably, and I know you might touch on this, EC, you probably want to do it in the winner without Scheffler market. Most of the major books have that market available. There's only one that I can see right now that doesn't have it available. And I think that's the way to go. Of course, you're going to get reduced odds on some of these like heavy hitters, like, you know, Sahith Tagala, like, or, or Wyndham Clark, you know, instead of 20 to one, it might be you know, 16 to one, or instead of 14 to one, it might be 10 to one. But honestly, with this tournament, the way Scotty Scheffler has been playing and his success here, and the fact that he's such a good course fit, uh, I'd, I'd consider both of those things scaling back the outright market, but then also considering the winner without Scotty market. Yeah. I, I just don't think you can, you can't bet. I, I cannot bet uh, Scotty Scheffler plus 275 or thereabouts to win a golf tournament. You just, there, there's four days and so many things that can happen. Now, everything Patrick said is a hundred percent spot on. And Scotty Scheffler is probably going to win. So my storyline is very simple. What's the best way to bet outrights in this tournament, with or without Scheffler? I think to me, it's you just you got to avoid Scotty. Now there's one book that has a no Scotty, Wyndham, Finau, or Zalatoris market, and it's really not that different than uh, the the without Scotty. I mean, you can get Tigala. I think it plus twelve hundred in that one, and plus fourteen hundred without Scheffler. So I mean, still there, there's value there. But I, I just I, I don't think you can play traditional outrights this week. Patrick, now hearing that, C is in my logic. Are you against playing normal outrights? Or are you like, all right, I'm going to take my shot later in the show? I'm taking my shot, right? I mean, he only takes up 25% of the win equity, so to speak. So there's still plenty of there, plenty of that out there. And uh, you just got to hope that uh, Scotty Scheffler is just a little off and he might be looking towards uh, towards the Masters a little bit. Well, one area where you can attack things this week, and maybe it's not betting in the outright market, but it's in the DFS market. And what's interesting, Sia, I'll start with you. Uh, if I remember this tournament, the Houston Open was played in twenty twenty last in November 2022. And mm -hmm. the winner of that tournament was one Tony Fina, who is on my, I believe, no bet list. Uh, I think that we'll see once again later in the show. But you were fading him for DFS purposes. Why? Yeah, not super interested in Tony P now. I mean, the ball striking hasn't been there. Obviously, we know he has the short game, or I should say the putting difficulties. I, you know, listen, from a game theory standpoint, even though he's the former champ or last year's champ, he's not getting a ton of ownership. So again, from a game theory standpoint, maybe you want to play a little bit of Tony P now. I'm just out on Tony Fee. Now, I think there's a lot of different game theory angles you can play here, which which might mean you don't play Scotty Scheffler. Maybe it means you don't play Wyndham Clark. Maybe it means you start your lineup at Jason Day and you just have like super low ownership percentage. I think there's a lot of angles here, uh, but I'm just not interested in playing a Tony Fee now that seems completely off. Yes, he's a good course fit. Yes, he's won here, uh, you know, just last year, kind of last year, the last time they played at Memorial Park, but it uh, the game just doesn't look right. So I, I'm out on Tony Finau. I'm in on Jason Day. This is a guy I don't normally tout in any market, really. But again, I'm thinking game theory here, and, and I'm thinking Jason Day uh, of the top five to ten guys, he's a guy that's not getting a ton of attention from an ownership standpoint. Don't forget, DFS is a game. It's not about like what we see in the betting market necessarily, where we just like a guy to top 20 or to win or to, in a head-to-head -head matchup. We're playing the ownership game in DFS as well. And Jason Day, he hasn't been striking it super well, especially on approach. But I do think that game could come back to him. And, and the short game is there for him. The off-the-tee game, he's pretty long. I'm looking at driving distance to a large degree. So just from a game theory standpoint, I think you can play Jason Day. And you can go ahead if you want and take the chalk with Scotty Scheffler. And, and you're still going to have a ton of money left over because we have this 5,000 range and a 6,000 range that's really rich with some guys that you might want to play in this tournament. So there's really no cost issue in this tournament, which is probably why Scotty Scheffler is going to be 40 plus percent owned because you can play him and you can play so many other guys. You could even play Scotty and Wyndham Clark if you want and still have a decent lineup. I just want to point that out. So that's, that's actually also a reason to fade Scotty Scheffler again, from a game theory standpoint, other two guys, I'll be real quick. Cause we're going to touch on these guys later too. Kurt Kitty. at 8,100. I think his game is very fit for this course. Love the short game, love the driving distance. Um, we'll see what the ball striking overall looks like for Kurt Kitayama, particularly on approach. But I think he's a great course fit. And Joseph Bramlett in the 6,600 range, not getting as much attention from an ownership standpoint as I thought he would. But maybe that'll pick up over the next day and a half. But Bramlett actually has been playing pretty well. He's a really good course fit for this course. Hits it a long way, too. I think 6,600 is a nice price. All right, fair enough. You're going to the bargain bin. That's where Patrick McDonald usually lies. 
But I'm going to start here because he's fading a golfer that I actually really like this week in Tom Hoagie. Now, Patrick, Tom Hoagie is one of the best iron players in the world and really doesn't get a lot of credit for it. I mean, if you look at strokes gained approach, been really good. Why are you fading him at 9,000, which seems like a decent price? Yeah, I think at nine, I'd rather just play the, the guys around him. I mean, he's not going to be one of these guys who draws a ton of ownership, probably around 10%. But uh, I'm not a huge hoagie guy on, on big ballparks. I like him where you can kind of bunt it off the tee and let that iron play shine, like you said. So I'm okay passing up on hoagie at 9,000. I, I won't have any FOMO or anything like that, kind of just going to bypass him. But the players who I will play, Taylor Moore getting sucked into this one again, 7,600. Nice final round there to kind of backdoor that top 15 last week. I believe it was uh, 566. Iron play looks fantastic. Plenty long off the tee. Around the green game looks good too. So I, I love what I'm seeing out of the guy. And then Akshay Batia at 7,500. What he can do on these bigger ballparks is, is kind of drawing me in. Uh, he fit, he had a nice top 20 last week, but uh, played well at the Farmers Insurance Open, Torrey Pines. Played well at the Century. He was in the final group there on Sunday before imploding. Uh, so Akshay at 7,500. And then Carson Young, 6,200. Guy just makes cuts. Six out of the last seven. Nice start there at the Mexico Open. T8, you think about a big ballpark, a place where, oh, I don't know, Tony Finau has played well in the past as well. Uh, so I'm going to give him a try at 6,200. Look at you integrating uh, baseball into our golf references this week with it being opening day on Thursday. I like how you just compared your DFS picks to baseball players. Hey, listen, you never know what you're going to get on the early wedge, but I love the comparison. Now, one thing that we have not, I don't think we've hit one of these yet this year, and we're all going to get involved in this, especially for the Masters. But see, you have some picks as per usual for FRLs. And your first one is a guy that I, he burned us the other week, but I mean, I said I was going to bet him in some capacity in every tournament that he plays in. So, hey, I'm all over this uh, Will Zalatoris at plus 3,500. Yeah, I mean, he's certainly burned us at the players, but I think he's a great course fit, and, and we're a couple of weeks removed from the players. Uh, I think he's going to shake that off pretty easy. At plus 3,500, I'm kind of looking for the bounce back. I don't know if he's going to win this tournament, but I'm certainly looking for the bounce back for Will Zalatoris at plus 3,500. Uh, Steven Yeager at plus 5,500. Listen, Yeager hasn't been striking it as well as I'd like him to, but he does have the all-around game, and he does have really good course history here as well. I think he's a really sneaky option in the outright market, in the head-to-head -head market, uh, really in any market. So at plus 5,500 to be a first-round leader, and we've seen him, by the way, he's not a winner in terms of like winning over four rounds, right? And, and I'm not trying to be disrespectful. He's just not necessarily that guy. But in terms of a first-round leader, he has been that guy before, or at least, at least he's spiked in the first round. Uh, Luke List at 70 to 1. You know, Luke List is one of those guys that he can just really pop up at any given moment. And this is the type of course where Luke List certainly can pop up, uh, potentially with a win, but really more as a first round leader. We know he's a great ball striker. The the putting has improved a little bit. And if he can get away from the around the green game for one round, um, he could absolutely pop as a first round leader. Joel Dahman is a guy that I don't know what to say other than the last two tournaments, the ball striking has been so incredible that it's really hard for me to ignore him at 70 to one to be the winner after 18 holes. I don't think he can win this tournament, especially a tournament that Scotty Scheffler is in. I, I don't think he's necessarily going to be in the top five, but he is hitting it so well uh, from a ball striking standpoint. He seems to be kind of locked in. Uh, you know, I, I don't know exactly what it is, but 70 to one to be your first round leader. I'm in on that. And Andrew Novak, we again, we hit him top 30 uh, at plus 220 last week on this show. Uh, he's just a really good player. And I just don't think people are noticing. I, he's very popular in DFS, by the way. He's very inexpensive. He's very popular. The only reason he wasn't on my DFS list is because he was so popular. I, I may as well, I'll play him a little bit, but I may as well go to some pivots and put those out there. But Andrew Novak is striking it really well. The finishing positions are great. He had one slip up over his last four tournaments. Otherwise, he has been completely locked in. Wouldn't surprise me at all if he's a first-round leader. There is plenty of synergy between my finishing position bets and this list. I will just tease that. But coming up next in our next segment, there's a word that I have never used in my life that will be uttered during this matchup section. Get ready. But first, let's hear from one of our sponsors. The best couch potatoes come from Pluto TV country. And these taters, they like all sorts of different things. Survivor Channel, Ink Master Channel. If it's got a spaceship in it, I'm probably watching it. Three channels dedicated to CSI. Whatever mood you're in, it's going to be easy watching. 
All right. Now, Patrick, you have one matchup, and and I have said the all four, all five words, I think, in, in that matchup before. So that's the tease. Tell us why you like uh C is the C is in the Steven Yeager fan club, but I guess you are this week as well. Stefan Yeager, yes, the German, uh, minus 110. I'm picking him over Jake Knapp, founder of the Napster. Uh, shout out to Sean Parker of Herndon, Virginia. See ya. I know that's your neck of the woods as well. Uh, yeah, yeah I, I'm, go I'm going Jaeger. Hopefully you got that connection. Not many will. Um, I'm going Jaeger, though, because uh, I, I think he just has a higher floor than Knapp at the moment. You look at where they played well. It's the same golf courses, Mexico, Farmers Insurance Open. Uh, but Jaeger's coming off uh, an off week, which I think is huge. He had one of the longest made cut streaks on the PGA Tour that just recently came to an end. I think he's going to get back on the wagon this week, has a great history here. The driver's much improved compared to those starts as well. Uh, so I'm going to go with Jaeger, minus 110 over Nap. Normally the transition would be to go to Sia with Steven Jaeger over Olison and Cam Davis, as he'll explain. But what is an Oceana? Because that is something that I have never... Uh, used before normally it's like top australian w where did we come up with this term and what does it mean and how did you find it so first of all david bileski in the chat he says patrick obviously watched the social network one time which is hilarious uh everybody knows patrick's watched it at least two times but it's it's funny mm -hmm. that he put in a comment because david is from new zealand uh, i know that i work with david he does a lot of golf content excellent and yep. oceania is australia and new zealand effectively it's actually oh. a lot of other islands too but instead of just having top australian they're basically encompassing uh, uh they're encompassing new zealand in there as well it's basically you know next the next door neighbor to australia so uh, i i guess i'll start there i have jason day as uh top oceania and he's going against basically you know a, a lot of australians and lot, not like a lot of Australians. I'm saying the lot of Australians. Uh, it's Cameron Davis. It's uh, Aaron Baddeley. It's Ryan Fox. It's Harrison Endicott and Rain Gibson. A, a couple of those guys, I think, could do well in this tournament because they're good course fits, but their game has been so bad lately that I'm willing to just rest on Jason Day's game. And, and it's Ryan Fox and Cameron Davis that I think are good course fits, but but that are in atrocious form right now. So effectively, all I'm doing is fading those guys by taking this play. Aaron Baddeley has started to play really well, but I don't think he's the caliber of Jason Day. And the other two guys, Harrison Endicott and Ring Gibson, I, I honestly, I just don't think they're going to make the cut. Frankly, all five of these guys can miss the cut and Jason Day can make the cut and we win the we win the bet on uh, let's see, Friday afternoon. But so that's my nationality play. I also have Steven Yeager in a three ball tournament plus 145 over Thor Bjorn Olsen and Cam Davis. Again, you see a theme here with Cam Davis. While he is a good course fit, the game is all over the place. Uh, it's really bad right now. And he could pick it up a little bit in this tournament because he is a good course fit. But I don't think it's enough to surpass Steven Yeager or in the case of Jason Day, Jason Day. So Olsen's an interesting case study, you know, on the Euro Tour. Pretty good approach play, pretty good. But the long and short of it is it hasn't really translated over to the PGA Tour. And for the record, he's also a pretty short hitter. And so I just don't think he's going to have any advantages in particular over Steven Yeager or Stefan Yeager because it's certainly spelled that way. Everybody calls him Steven, so I'm going to call him Steven. Uh, maybe I'm wrong there. Uh, that So I like that three ball. Again, that's a tournament three ball. Uh, most of my three balls are round matchups. This is a tournament three ball. The other two, Kurt Kitayama plus 100 over Keith Mitchell. I don't think we see a bounce back from Sunday with Keith Mitchell. I, I think he's going to be potentially okay for a couple of rounds, but the around the green play, the short game really worries me with Keith Mitchell, and it doesn't worry me at all with Kurt Kitayama. So I, I actually think Kurt Kitayama has a lot of potential in this tournament. I like him at even money over Keith Mitchell. And finally, Tony Finau. Let's find ways to fade Tony Finau. I just don't like the state of the game, and I love what Siwoo Kim has been doing. So I'll take Siwoo Kim minus 110 over the defending champion. All right. I like that as well. I'm not a, not big on Finau this week, but I am going to play the uh, my my matchup, Sahith Tagala over Jason Day. I'm not a, not big on Day. I mean, I know you guys like him. Uh, minus 125, you can find this one, bet 365. All three of Day's top 10s this year have come at the elevated, uh, smaller events. In the other four events that he's played in, with a full field, no top 30s. Just pointing that out. Tagala, it's a home game for him. He's a Houston resident. Top 10s in three of his last four, and I'm getting a reasonable price at minus 125. Sign me up for that. All right. Then I love this one. Uh, Patrick, I don't know if you want any of this action here. It's plus money for me. Uh, Tom Hoagie over Alex Noren. The Nor Noren was solid in Florida, T9 and T19, but no other top 20s this season. Did have a T4 here in 2022, but I can't fade an elite iron player in Hoagie. 
against a guy who's never won on the PGA Tour. I mean, uh, and I'll explain why I like Hoagie a little bit later on with that iron play. It's just, it's so good, and I'm getting plus money. So, Patrick, I just, I don't know if you're interested because you were fading him, but just inquiring minds want to know. I'm I'm good, EC. I'm okay. good. Okay. All right. All right. I just I just wanted to I just wanted to ask. I, I appreciate it. I appreciate, yeah. 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 I mean, I'm trying to recoup some of that money that I lost. Still bitter about my Scotty Scheffler. Uh, why I included him on my no bet list? That was very very foolish. But the rest of the list has proven to be very you know solid thus far. All right. Time for finishing positions. I'll be honest. Last week, see, you did great. I got smashed in this in this particular column. Uh, I normally had done pretty well lately. It was just, it was not, not a good week for me. So Sia, you have the floor here. Uh, where are you going this week as far as, uh, actually you and I agree on, on a couple of them or on one of them, especially you're going back to one of the guys in your fan club, Andrew Novak. Yeah. Andrew Novak fan club sits right here. T40 at plus 120. Like, I feel like I'm playing it relatively safe. Remember last week I had Andrew Novak T30 uh, and, and we were getting plus 220 there. So uh, I really like this number on him. And listen, he's not a super long hitter either, but he's not super short. I just want to point that out because driving distance really will come into play in this tournament, in my opinion. Uh, but again, at plus 120, the way he's been playing, I, I think I think he's, I think this is a bet where you could ladder it where you could put it. Let, let's say you're betting a full unit, which again, in finishing positions, I don't necessarily recommend. So let's say you're putting a half a unit on Andrew Novak at plus 120. Maybe you put like 0.2 units on the top 30 play and 0.1 units on the top 20 play and just see where you go. Even if you lose the top 30 and top 20 and you cash the, the top 40, you're still coming out ahead. So just something to think about with some of these players that are kind of unknown. So their odds are pretty long, but they certainly have some upside. I think Joseph Bramlett is one of those guys as well. We're not really recognizing Joseph Bramlett yet because he hasn't done it on any consistent basis, but the game does seem to be emerging for him. T40 at plus 115. Again, a very long hitter. Seems to be a little bit more dialed in now than in recent history, and I think that's partly because he had an injury that he was contending with uh, over the last year, something that I didn't know about until recently, so maybe that's cause for the emergence. Kurt Kitayama, T30, another plus money play. I honestly think Kurt Kitayama has an outside shot to win this tournament. And just let me be very clear. I said outside shot. So I'm not, I'm not, you know, saying anything like, Hey, he's, he's a legit top five on Sunday, but Kurt Kitayama, I just think is a great course fit here. Plus plus one ten, And then Sith T20. Look, I don't want to bet Sith in, in the outright market. Really? I, I do think he can win. But I feel way more comfortable with his game and his course fit in, in the T20 market at even money. I've got four plays in the finishing position market, all at even money or better. And I, Sahith is certainly one of my favorites because he can really explode in a good way at any given moment. And, and because he sprays it a little bit, because the rough is not very penal at Memorial Park, he should be fine. And, and I, I love what he can do with a short game sometimes. Give me the T20. All right, before I get into my picks here, Patrick, I'm going to ask you a question. If you were to name, outside of Scotty Scheffler, the, the next two best iron players in the world right now, who are they? Hmm. I just had this uh, on my screen. It's going to be Xander Shoffley. Okay. In your opinion, I'm saying. In your opinion. Oh, in my opinion? Yeah. Uh, best iron players in the world, based on opinions. Yeah, but... based on, we know Scotty's going to be one. Yeah, yeah I would put Tom Hoagie. Tom Hoagie would be towards the top of my list, of course. Just want okay. to point that out. Yeah, uh, Scotty Shuffler is one by margin. Okay. Uh, Xander Shoffley, I'd put him up there. And then, I don't know, to tell you the I truth. I think you're missing one. I got I got his name on the screen right there. Willis oh, Alatoris. Well, mm, I don't think he's there quite yet. I don't think I, he's see, there quite yet. You don't think so? See, I'm thinking that Will Zalatoris is arguably the second-best iron player on tour at the moment. Colin Morikawa would be up there. Xander would be up there. I think you can make an argument this season for Zalatoris. He's gained strokes on approach in all six events that he has played in. Now, we know the driver and the putter, are they can be an issue, especially that that weird, like, long putter deal going on, the old Ad, or the Adam Scott formula there. But as a top 20, similar to what Sia did with Sahith, yeah, I'm good with that at even money. At BetMGM, sounds good to me. Uh, Joel Damon, I like a lot. Uh, Sia talked about him in his FRLs. I'm playing a little ladder action here in a way. Uh, top 20 plus 250, top 40 at plus 105. T5 and T9 in two appearances here, and he's gained 15 more than 15 strokes ball striking combined in those two events. In the last two weeks, gained more than nine strokes ball striking. You alluded to this, Sia, in route to a T11 and T49. Now, the reason he had a T49 is because he was absolutely miserable around and on the greens last week at the Valspar. 
if he performs to field average, yeah, we should we should probably hit this. His his long game right now has been outstanding. And then you know the CF fan club, Andrew Novak, top forty plus one twenty. I'm copying that play there. He's missed his first three cuts in 2024. Since then, he went T8, T8, T9, a missed cut, and T17 last week. Just cashing tickets left and right. I got to get on, on board the train here. So let's do it. He has gained strokes combined and on the greens, uh, on and around the greens uh, in his last six. Pretty darn good. Now, the one place that you want to bet these is at BetMGM because they pay out ties. They're the only sports book that, that fully pays out ties on, the, on these finishing positions. And that's very important this week especially if you play the not Scotty Scheffler market, which you can also bet at BetMGM. If you are not a BetMGM customer, it's time. New BetMGM customers can sign up today and get up to a $1,500 in bonus bets. Just place your first wager of at least $10 and you'll receive up to $1,500 inst $1, instantly if your bet loses with bonus code EDGE. That's E-D-G-E, EDGE. All right, coming up next, it's time for my, well, auto fade graphic. But before that, let's hear from one of our sponsors. The blackout mystery remains. Welcome to March Madness. Oh, no. oh, you just never know in the tournament who is going to shine. Stream March Madness live on any device, anywhere, and be ready for anything. All right, see ya. You know, I'm going to ask you about it. It's the Sweet 16. You can see it on CBS this week. And one of the teams that's playing, actually the first game on Thursday, that we're all excited for is my alma mater, the University of Arizona, a team that you, I believe, were fading. Do you still feel that way? Oh, Patrick. Pat, is that how you do it? Is that how you do it? No, we, you we, do? Do, wild, we do Wildcats. Oh, the sorry, w, sorry. The C, yeah. Uh, so there, much cool. better. Very cool. Yeah, how do you feel about my Wildcats now? Yeah, you see, your way was way cooler. Um, How do I feel about the Wildcats? Well, understand that in my main brackets, I have the Wildcats going. I mean, I had a couple where I had them losing to Baylor, but the, the other two or three – I had them losing to North Carolina. I mean, it's been a pretty easy, like they're, they're just kind of cruising to, to yep. easy victories so far. And, and what is it? Clemson, a pretty nice matchup for them. Seven and a half point spread. I expect them to win that game. Although I've been underrating Clemson apparently the last two games because they burned me. Uh, listen, I think this is inevitable. I think we're going to see North Carolina beat Alabama. We're going to see Arizona prevail over Clemson. And that's going to be the game. Whoever wins that's likely going to play UConn. Uh, I have an outright ticket on North Carolina that I put in like two and a half months ago at 40 to one. So I'm going to be a big North Carolina fan if and when they play Arizona. I mean, I guess credit to Arizona, but in my opinion, no offense, they haven't done anything yet. So I mean, I mean, right, if they, if they yeah. beat Clemson handily, I'll be a little impressed. And then if they beat North Carolina, then I'm like, all right, well, well, here we go. The question becomes for you. If that happens, it's celebration worthy, but can they actually beat UConn? I actually think the answer is no, but we'll we'll find out. Uh, probably not. I mean, you never know. It, it would be a home game, and I would be there at the Final Four. It's in my backyard here. Cool. Let us hope. Patrick, you're a South Carolina guy, though. You don't you live down in on the East Coast over there? Yeah, I'm a, I'm in uh, Charleston, South Carolina. The uh, the Cougars lost their first round matchup against the Crimson Tide, but mm -hmm. uh, my, my my picks are doing pretty well. Also, I was telling you guys before this, I pick strictly on geography. For the most part, there's some feel also, but I picked the more Eastern team. There's been some uh, mistakes on my end thinking, oh, Oakland's in California. Oh, let me pick Kentucky. Newsflash, it's not. It's not. So that, that was a smash play based on geography, but it was closer in actuality. But you think about teams like NC State. Uh, there's a mix up with Mississippi State and Michigan State. A lot closer on the map than you would think. Mm -hmm. A lot closer. So I got that one wrong. But uh, overall, I think uh, seven out of eight into the Elite Eight. I still have a live Samford. I had them uh, going far for some reason. But, you I, know. Hey, listen, they played a good game against Kansas. All right. We're, we're fading your South Carolina. Clemson, obviously, in your in your state where you reside. Oh, that's fine. Arizona. That's fine. Yeah. Okay. Good. You're good with that? Okay, good. Fair down. That's all I have to say. All right. It's time for finishing. Or not finish, It's time for outrights. Um, and let's go to my graphic here because we have some new additions this week. Uh, yeah, we're adding Justin Thomas after what he did on Saturday. When you're tied for the lead and then you shoot eight over, you get you get banned to this list. Keith Mitchell is an – I mean, that should be permanent. Uh, you cannot bet Keith Mitchell after what we saw on Sunday. Sia gave his logic for why I should have probably not done that. But after seeing I, – I mean, literally, I think, I think Jake and Patrick could have gone out there on tour and beaten what Keith Mitchell did on Sunday. Uh, you guys are pretty good golfers. You're single-digit handicapped. I mean, that was pretty bad. So, uh, yeah, we're fading those two guys. 
And listen, I, I don't think uh, Finau, we've, we've talked about him. Cam Young, after what you saw from him, Sia, you can't argue with that. Sahith is one. You know what? I, we might want to put a line through that one because I'm going against my own logic this week. Sahith, I, I'm, I'm gaining some faith in you. So my auto fade list, I'm actually going against it this week. Well, in a way, I'll explain that. But Patrick, you're going to start. You think Scotty Scheffler is going to win, but you're still playing the regular outright market. Yeah, I mean, uh, there's 70%, 75% of the win equity still out there. So you got to gobble it up somehow. So Sahith Thigala, I think, has a great chance at winning this week. It is e an even better pick knowing it's on the auto fade list of EC. So give me him at 22 to 1. He's been fantastic this year, coming off back to back, back top 10s. And if you want to talk about geography, Japan, saying my college basketball picks ain't it, just wait, <laughs> just wait until all the East Coast teams win this weekend. Uh, Sahith Thigala, Houston boy, home game models, off the chart. Come on, great golf course for him, great fit. He's playing great. Don't overthink it. Siwoo Kim, 30 to 1, same deal, fine around 64 there at TPC Sawgrass. Really doesn't seem to have a hole in his tee to green game the putter he might be switching models like every week it seems like but if he can just be you know slightly above average i really like his chances to uh to contend and then kurt kidiyama for all the reasons that sia said does he have a great chance no but i do believe he does have a chance and the mm -hmm. iron play, ball striking has been great he's a long driver off the tee good on these open ballparks so 55 to 1 i'm willing to take a stab with kurt as well on the next episode of Early Wedge, we're going to compare golf courses to ballparks. No, we'll do that down the road, but something it would be kind of fun to feel, you know, what is your Wrigley Field of golf course? What is your Fenway Park? Do you have a list of this, Patrick, or no? Fenway is probably St. Andrews, right? It's old. It has a lot of history, mm -hmm. a lot of reverence, but like it's kind of beaten down. Is it really that nice once you get there? If you say something mean about it, people probably get mad. Uh, so that's the one that really comes uh, top of what top about What about Wrigley, Wrigley and Pebble Beach? A lot of wind going on there. You know, wind can affect it significantly. It, older core. I'm just throwing that sure, one out there. Maybe. Sure, that's a good one. I'll take it. A any suggestions? Throw them in the chat. We'll we'll read them a little bit later. See, you're going you're going a hybrid between Patrick and I. Let's hear why do you like Wyndham and, and Kurt? And I, yeah, I like Wyndham and Kirk. I, I, I might add one to my card here. I, I put out the sports line article, and, and that'll probably come out late tonight, if not very early tomorrow morning. It's very likely I add a third person to the mix. I, I kind of wanted to be reserved because of the Scotty Scheffler factor and because the without Scotty market isn't technically everywhere, but it really is at most places. Mm -hmm. I, I just want to point out, if I add one, it's probably going to be either Siwoo Kim, Sahith Tagala, or Will Zalatoris. Not all three, literally one of those three. I just haven't made that determination. Wyndham Clark, I think, is interesting because – I know he just won and it wasn't necessarily like big game hunting in terms of the type of tournament, but he does strike me as a guy that might not take this tournament as seriously kind of gearing up for the masters. But what I think is sort of counter to that argument is that he's finished second place twice in a row at the players and at the API to a guy that's actually in this tournament, Scotty Scheffler. I do think Wyndham Clark works on motivation more than some of these other golfers. So it does strike me as maybe a good opportunity to put himself ahead of Scotty Scheffler and actually take down a tournament going into the Masters. I, it's kind of a little ride down narrative street. I don't really need a narrative, right? Wyndham Clark's been striking it really well. The short game is really good historically with Wyndham Clark. So he absolutely could be the winner of this course, you know, regardless, but I do like Wyndham Clark at 14 to one, 11 to one without Scotty. And then again, Kurt Kitayama, we've already talked about him without Scotty. His odds are around 40 to one uh, with, with Scotty 55 to one. And again, I'll probably add one more. I just haven't decided who, who it is yet. I, you know, I don't have that kind of courage that either of you have clearly. Uh, so I'm going with the without Scheffler market here going Sahith at plus 1400 home game this week. As I mentioned earlier, top tens and three of his last four, as I mentioned, that putter is red hot right now. So I like that not to win because I think Scotty's going to win, but I like him at plus 1400 in this particular market. Siwoo Kim is, as has been discussed. Uh, I like him as well this week. Gain strokes with the driver in 21 of his last 22 uh, shot link uh, measured events. Had a top 10 at the players. The putter, I think, Patrick, you mentioned this. Putter, not so good. Uh, he needs to try something different. Work for Scotty. Siwoo needs to really try something different. Uh, maybe he needs to do the, the long putter, bring out his driver again like he did at the Masters. Or what was that, his three-wood? Uh, he should probably give that a whirl because it's not working out with a flat stick. 
And Hoagie, uh, I, listen, I mean, he's gained strokes on approach in his last 13 tournaments. In his last six, get this, he's gained more than 33 shots combined on approach with those irons. Two top 10s and four top 20s in those six tournaments. He's putting pretty well at plus 3,500 without Scotty Scheffler involved. Yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm okay with that. So we'll take a shot with that. But now let's see what you guys have when it comes to long shots. And see, I, I'm going to start with you because that's the pick I was going to put in there. But you know, I'm too busy making parlays <laughs> than to go outrights. And I actually love what you did here with your pick. Yeah, my long shot outright. I guess I do technically have a third outright here because it's a long shot. It's Joel Damon at plus 8,000. I was between him and Luke List at plus 8,000, full disclosure, uh, because I do think Luke List profiles pretty well for this tournament. But again, it's so hard for me to, and for the record, while Luke List profiles pretty well, like the ball striking isn't exactly where I, I want it to be with him. Whereas with Joel Damon, it's like out of control. And, and again, it, it could fall off. It could completely fall off a cliff coming into Memorial Park here. Like, I, I don't know exactly what's going on with this game, but it's really hard for me to ignore 80 to one or in some markets, 75 to one Joel Damon, knowing how well he's striking the ball. And again, if you want to take Joel, Joel Damon without Scotty Scheffler, like I actually haven't looked at what those odds are, but I'm guessing ballpark. There's somewhere in the 65 to 70 to one range, which by the way, it's not a bad payout, right? So uh, it's something to consider. The way his game is, I'm willing to throw a few bucks on a guy that is absolutely killing it with the ball striking. All right, Patrick, Taylor Moore, we saw him win last year at the Valspar, and he, has he done a lot since? Uh, I mean, I think I picked him somewhere uh, the other week, and he didn't do much for me. Why are you on him at 80-1 to 1 here? <laughs> See, I love your pick, Patrick. What the hell are you doing <laughs> picking Taylor Moore? Uh, look, he's he's been very consistent. Uh, hasn't missed a cut this year. Super well-rounded. I, I think he's just waiting to peak almost. Not waiting, but he's on the verge of peaking, it seems like. And I think that final round there at the Valsbar Championship, 566 is uh, the start of something really good. So I, I love his skill set in general, and I think 80-1 to 1, the number we bet him at last week why not let's try it again you know what you are the only one that has i believe picked a winner on this program this year and jake knapp in mexico so you know what who am i to talk especially when my parlays here that i give out have been pretty dreadful lately but we're going to take a few shots half a unit each on on these because you know i like the shot top 10 parlays alatoris and thigala now you can find these too on fanduel they have uh tournament specials uh so tourney specials you can find these uh, they also have Similar ones on, on DK, but the odds are actually better this week uh, for these at, uh, at FanDuel, especially for this first one. Uh, so Zalatoris and Tigala like that one. Look at this next one. Top 10 parlay, Scheffler, Zalatoris, and Wyndham Clark. So uh, Scheffler and Wyndham Clark have gone 1-2, uh, respectively, in the last two tournaments that they both played in at the players and uh, before that, the Arnold Palmer. And Zalatoris has two top fours in his last three tournaments. I'm just saying, at 15-1, to 1, you can do worse, and they pay out ties on both these bets. So uh, I just I want to I want to throw that out there. All right. In the chat, uh, Sites 501 gave out a good one. Augusta equals Yankee Stadium, in his opinion. Patrick, if you were to compare a ballpark to a to Augusta, which would you choose? Hmm. PNC Park, Pittsburgh. Beautiful I mean, park. best Why? view in the best view in the game. Oh, okay. uh, nicest ballpark in America. Easily. History is not quite there outside of the Johnny Cueto wildcard game back in uh, a couple couple decades, a decade or so ago. But uh, based on look, I'd say PNC Park. Based on history, I mean, Yankee Stadium's rather new, isn't it? I'm not a huge baseball guy, but am, am I wrong? No, I, I, see, where would you, if, for Augusta, what would be your first course comp that would, or your first ballpark comp that would come to mind? That was a good one from Patrick. Yeah, I mean, it would have to have a lot of history. Are we talking? I mean, Wrigley makes a lot of sense. Uh, Boston, what, what um, it's it's alluding Fenway, to Fenway, Fenway Park. Um, yeah, it would, it would probably be Fenway or or Wrigley. Okay, and I think maybe, I think the Yankee Stadium is good. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, maybe the Astros when they had the uh, the little hill in center field. I mean, in that's Towles the glory. Yep, yeah, yeah. That's that's the glory days of, of baseball, right? Right then and there. Shame they got rid of that. And, and the flagpole where, where the center fielder could run straight head on into it. Of course, that made a lot of sense. Uh, Patrick, I want to ask you about this this tournament. When it comes to prior history here, uh, they, they played it in November in 2020, 21, and 22. And I haven't played here, obviously, uh, at, at Memorial Park uh, in the spring. 
do you pay much attention to the course history that we've seen from these players or is it a completely different golf course in your opinion from November to, to April? It Nearly is a different April. golf course. It's going to be softer. Scores are going to be better. Uh, Chipping is going to be easier with the overseas. So I'm not really taking too much into course history or any of that and just looking at general course fit. See, my my uh, dart throw for you here. Now, last week I found a bet after I did the show, and I'm sorry I didn't get it out there. Uh, it was total strokes. And we know the Valspar played tough, and they, uh, I believe FanDuel had it at like the winner would go 15 under par and didn't come close, and that was a good hit. The same line this week is, is 14 and a half under par. Would you say the uh, score would be two? So it's at par 70. So 280 is the par. Would you say over under 265 and a half? You gonna take the over or the under? So you're talking about the winning score being winning 15 score. under or or or, or better. Or, or or less, yeah, or however you want to phrase that. Yep. Yeah, I so I don't exactly know. I know Thursday's a pretty calm day, but I do think the wind's gonna pick up over the weekend. And I do think overall, I I think it's a challenging course, maybe less challenging uh this version of it, but I think. I think it'll be shorter than 15 under par. In other words, I think the winner is looking to me, the winner's looking at like minus 12, minus 13. Patrick, you agree with that? Uh, I'd push it to like, I, I think it'd be like 15, 16. Ooh. So what we're saying is don't play that bet this week. That's our, <laughs> our guys disagree. I'm just, just saying, guys, great show uh, as always. Want to want to promote something, I guess, because, you know, I, I'm a part of this, but. We're bringing back the Friday trio of Uncle Dave, Proppy, and myself. NFL Draft Preview Series starts this Friday, 4 p.m. Eastern. Check that out. You can find the counselor on uh, Early Edge every weekday. He is he is there. And you can find Patrick on, I believe, First Cut. When are you on this week? Yeah, First Cut. We had our show uh 5 o'clock. But we will be on CBS Sports Network next Tuesday at 2 p.m. little Masters Preview for you guys. Might, might dust out the old... Uh, the old tuxedo for that one. You know what? That is a can't miss. But we'll see you next Tuesday at 7 p.m. Eastern to recap that and talk about the Valero Texas Open. But, guys, great show once again, as always. Thanks to producer Jake behind the scenes. He does a great job every week. For Patrick McDonald and C. Najad, I am EC. As I always like to say, let's hit it big. Good luck.